to keep us on track, I'd like to uh, go ahead and keep us um, with our next session, session number two. And I'd like to invite Liz York and Brian um, Gillian up to the stage. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, welcome to our um, afternoon session, putting buildings, uh, policies uh, into practice to improve health. I'm Brian Gilligan, as was mentioned, and work with the GSA. I'm here with uh, Liz York, who will be uh, co-moderating the, uh, the panel. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and invite our panelists out um, first. Um, so first up, we have Dr. Matthew Trowbridge. Uh, Dr. Trowbridge is a physician and professor of medicine at UVA's School of Medicine. First seat on the end. All right, perfect. Next, we have um, Andrea Swatocha. Um, Ms. Swatocha is manager of facility planning and design for DC public schools. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Stephanie, Ta I'm sorry, uh, Shannon Krauss. Mr. Krauss is principal and executive vice president at HKS Architects. And then we have Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a physician and CEO of Taylor Healthcare Consulting. Then we have Dr. Casey Lindbergh. Uh, Dr. Lindbergh is a postdoc research associate and architect at the UA University of Arizona Institute on Place and Well-Being. And then last but not least, we have Mr. Brian Steverson. Uh, Mr. Steverson is a high performance buildings program advisor in GSA's Office of High Performance Buildings and a uh, colleague of mine. So welcome everybody. Thank you very much. So as I mentioned before, the uh, title of our session involves words like buildings and practice and policy. And our uh, panelists here are going to be speaking to all of those things. But I, I really do want to add a bit of perspective, which is to say that um, those things are all important, of course. But at the essence, at the heart of what we're really talking about is people. Um, my, my boss, Kevin Kamsher, likes to say that buildings exist for people and not the other way around. Um, he says that to me rather frequently. I guess I'm a recovering facility manager, and I don't always get that. <laughs> but the folks on our panel do. And I think you'll hear them speak to that issue and do it with passion. So talk just a little bit about the, uh, um, the, the format of our session real quick. This is a lightning round. We have six speakers, as you can see. We've divided them into three pairs. Each pair is going to speak for just 15 minutes about a specific health uh, sector of the built environment. So we'll be talking about um, schools, healthcare facilities, and commercial office buildings. Um, after each pair is done speaking, um, Liz will engage them in a little bit of follow-up questioning. And at the end of our session, we'll take questions from the audience. So do be thinking about your questions and, and be ready to ask them. Um, these are great people to ask. Um, so really quickly, I'll introduce the, uh, the first two speakers that we have today. Um, we'll be talking with, uh, these are addressing the school sector. Um, Dr. Matthew Trowbridge will be talking to us about designing to increase physical activity of kids and staff and ideas to make health promotion a standard in all building projects. And then he'll be followed by um, Andrea. Uh, she's going to discuss how the district, uh, Washington, D.C., is leveraging the D.C. Green Building Act um, and existing health promotion policies to improve the lives of children. So let's uh, uh, go ahead and give them a round of applause. And I think we'll start with Matt. Sounds good. Is on? Is on? All right. Well, good afternoon. <coughs> uh, my name is Matthew Trowbridge. And uh, to kick things off, uh, I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes as, as a thank you very much for that introduction because I do firmly agree that ultimately what we're assembled here today to do is not really to talk about buildings, at least I hope not, we're really here to talk about people and how buildings and the way we design the built environment uh, can improve our lives. And, what a, and the story I'm going to tell you guys about is my own personal story of an opportunity to work in a rural school district and really specifically uh, a lesson I learned from a very visionary uh, superintendent. Uh, in a central Virginia school district, Buckingham County. And basically, this, um, this all centers around a, uh, this school, uh, which you see here, Buckingham Elementary, which is in central Virginia. And the superintendent came to VMDO Architects, and basically, you know, it was this school district only has about six schools in its entirety. Okay, so when it was time to do a major renovation of the really pretty much the elementary school and middle school in the county, uh, it was a really big deal. And they had a bond and, and they had uh, you know, a sizable budget you know, uh, to, to do a cutting edge school. 
and they were hiring VMDO as a, as a really well-known, nationally ranked you know, uh, architecture firm that can do sustainability. But what he came to them with this challenge was, that's great, of course we want to make a green school, but what my job really is, is to forward the children of my county. I'm supposed to, so can we do more than that? Because honestly, VMDO, um, the, the money we're getting to do this school, whatever it was, $30 million budget or so, we're not going to see, $30 million doesn't come into my county very frequently for any purpose. So can we think about this school not so much as a building, but as a moment in the community where we could drive a different health conversation? And he specifically brought them to the problem of ch childhood obesity being a huge issue in their county. And he basically asked them, can you help this, make this school also forward the goals of, um, of, of the county? And they, of course, VMDO said, of course. And then they said, how? I don't know. And they called me, and that's how I got involved in all this. And, you know, Dillon is, not, is, a, is a rural school district. It's ethnically diverse. It's uh, very low. Uh, it's predominantly low income. Uh, We're not talking about a fancy uh, downtown uh, project on the cover of Dwell magazine or something. This was a real risk. It was a, it was a, uh, to do this in, in Dillwyn was, was challenging, but it was also really exciting. And when this challenge came across my desk, you know, I have to be honest, this was several years ago, I had never done anything like this before. So when they said, uh, we'd like to have the school building promote, you know, deal with childhood obesity prevention, well, my first reaction was basically like, oh, this is easy. We have, like, inch, I brought over literally, like, stacks of public health publications about the built environment in health and obesity prevention. The tricky thing was that one of our, my now dear friends at VMDO is an architect. She read all these things, you know, Dina Sorensen, and she basically was like, this is great. I believe you, but I have no idea what to draw yet. And I realized that's actually the point. That's actually what I should be working on. So what we actually worked on with VMDO was taking that uh, stack of papers, things we thought we knew about active design and so forth, and turning them into actionable physical activity design guidelines specific to school architecture. And that was exciting as well, uh, published actually by uh, Jerry Britton right there, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and now out for, for widespread use. The tricky part, though, as a, um, what I quickly learned was that was like the first like microsecond of the long timeline that we had of actually getting this to done. What happens next, of course, as a pediatrician was mind-blowing to watch how, the complexity of what, putting a school together and so forth. Um, and it, what it reiterated for me was this importance of always thinking about, like when you, making health part of the core story was the, real, was the real challenge. So that when the millions of decisions that had to be made to make this school come to fruition, that core focus on serving the children and creating an opportunity for physical activity promotion was protected. And VMDO, was, they, they jumped in with us to try to make that happen. The cool part is when you come into this school, we, we, we were able to pull this off. That's the good news story. When you walk into this school, um, you know, the physical activity guidelines, of course, took things like we're all probably familiar with, things like active design stairs. They made it into the project. Um, things like all the way down to the furniture choices, choosing furniture that allowed kids to have uh, less sedentary time by remaining active even when they were seated. And also just generally when you walk through the school, it is intentional that there is a celebration of kind of a culture of movement. And it's extremely exciting. And so that's the good news story. We can do this, okay? One school can, be, if you have a very special set of circumstances with an amazing leader, and an incredible architecture firm, and they happen to know a pediatrician has thought about this stuff, it can happen. But, as my friend uh, and colleague Chris Pike always likes to say, for this to really make a difference, we've got to move beyond random acts of health promotion in the built environment. And actually what he's always taught me is that's actually what really happened in the green movement. Before things like LEED existed, we were doing great stuff, but they were part of random acts of sustainability. And now we're trying to figure out, and that's what my team really focuses on now, is how do we take what we learned, that excitement of doing a Buckingham, and make it available for someone like Andrea to do at a school district level. And what, we've, what we are experimenting with is this idea of uh, borrowing from the green building movement. So in other words, saying, hey, we know we can do this in Buckingham. How do we bring this to scale? How do we make it actionable at a policy level? Well, um, and we think... Um, and we've been developing with some funding from Robert Wood Johnson over the last five years, 
exploring how green building took things like those, as you start to understand, maybe we can do practice in a slightly different way and um, bring it up to scale. How can we learn from green building and bring that to this, this new era of health promotion uh, and making that standard in the built environment? And basically, the way we're doing this is the way LEED did it, trying to think about how do you define best practice for an intentional process for designing something like a school to serve its kids. And, um, but, and then turning that into, by the, to define essentially a systematic process that a, any architecture firm could pick up, and importantly, that certifiers at groups like, uh, at, like at US Green Building Council can certify that, yeah, an intentional health process did occur here in this building. And so um, basically where we've gotten to is uh, we've taken inspiration from, uh, as we've defined that best practice, taken inspiration from the health impact assessment work, combined it with things from the building world of integrative process, where you gather your teams and think about things like all of the important energy-related impacts of a building at the beginning of a project and make sure there's nothing blocking uh, that from occurring. Our difference is we're trying to make sure we think about people-related systems at the beginning of a project and build that into what it means to deliver a high-performance green building going forward. And so now we have actually launched an integrative process for health promotion to go alongside uh, energy and water uh, in the LEED system. This is available live and ready for use. And uh, in our next few uh, years of work, we're going to be working with groups, like you'll hear from uh, Andrea at DC Schools, to try to see how do we take what we that kind of core lesson we learned from the superintendent in Buckingham uh, about focusing on people and try to build this into becoming a normative part of building practice. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Andrea. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Swiatoka. Um, more recently, over the last 10 years, I've been a practicing architect in private firms working specifically on education, uh, schools, or really anything uh, related in education facility. And at the beginning of this year, I had a really exciting opportunity. I had been working for DC Public Schools, um, and they offered and invited me to come over and really work on the owner side. And one thing that sort of interested me and got me excited to go to the owner side is to have this bigger, broader impact on movements such as health and health promotion across the building. So actually, Joanna Frank actually shared almost the same statistic earlier in her presentation. Um, I think it just hits home the importance of considering health when it comes to schools. And it's not just the students. It's also the staff that we serve. So DC Public Schools serves about 48,000 students across the district. Uh, we have over 115 schools that range. Uh, we even have zero to three, so infants and toddlers in the program, all the way up through high school. Uh, of that, we have over 4,000 teachers and principals, and that just begins to touch the surface. That doesn't even include all of our custodial staff, the foremen. So let alone just those people that are in the individual building, I think it's important to think about the population impact that those students have when they go home. So you're just like we've seen sort of with the sustainability movement and the recycling that has been a huge impact in schools, students are really aware of what they're eating at schools and how that translates to home. And I think that as we think about this health promotion across all 115 of our schools, we have a really big endeavor uh, behind us. So back in 2006, uh, DC enacted the Green Building Act, and as part of that, our requirement of all of our schools moving forward have to meet a minimum of LEED gold. Um, and so, to be honest, we've been doing that pretty successfully, and I think it's been a fantastic program because it holds us accountable as a district, it holds our teams accountable. Uh, we actually had Dunbar High School as one of uh, the first platinum buildings at the time that it opened uh, for a high school, which is fantastic. And so I think as a district, we're looking, what's that next step? Uh, if we have that, and it's a policy, and it's a program that we have to follow, what can we do to help with this health promotion? And as Matt sort of alluded to, our next step, every year we modernize four to five schools. So we're actually at the point where we're getting ready to open five schools, and we have five RFPs going out. And one thing that we are really excited about is that as part of this RFP process, we will be putting a requirement in there that the uh, design team will 
meet that Integrative for Health promotion process and that innovative credit that Matt and his team have been working on um, throughout the design process. And I think our team and what I'm my um, position is, what does that look like on a district level? So as I've sort of gotten my feet wet and got to meet with a lot of teams, actually, I think Fernando said it best <laughs> earlier when you said that you're sort of uh, this Rosetta Stone of translator. So we have over 15 different departments within DC public schools. We have the PE and health, we have the art, we have the music, you have your health services. You have your food services, you have all these different groups, and they sort of work in silos, but as facilities, I and my team interact with all of them. And I often get asked, why are you asking me these questions? What do you sort of care about the clinical side of things? And it's incredibly important and influential when you think about the health impact on these buildings. So to give you one, I'll give you two examples. Um, our PE and health program have a fantastic program where they actually teach the elementary students starting at the pre-K three and four level through uh, second grade how to ride a bike. We were really finding throughout the district that the majority of the students actually did not know how to ride a bicycle. And so the school of the district sort of took that on as a big initiative. Um, it's important, right, that every child knows how to ride a bike. And that's fantastic, we had this great curriculum, but how is the building supporting that? We're designing new elementary schools, and how do we help facilitate and support that curriculum. So as part of our design process, uh, we have two elementary schools in design right now. We've been working with our PE and health. What does a bicycle track around the exterior in the interior courtyard look like to help support that curriculum? That's just sort of one example where the, there's this fantastic curriculum that supports health, but that also needs to be translated into the built environment. Um, then there's also another one with our health services department. And they, so they really run the clinic side and they also uh, help support the wellness and lactation room. So while we have one in every school and it's part of our new standards, thinking about both the staff and the students, and this is really specific to middle and high school, you, the reality of our school system is that we do have um, teen pregnancy, but how do you support those teens coming back to school and also support um, them while they're at school and provide this wellness and lactation room. And that's a mixing of your staff and your students. And so while in the traditional maybe wellness and lactation room might look like one in a workplace where you just have workers, it looks very different in a model where you have a middle schooler and a teacher both wanting to use it. And so we've been working very closely about what does that design look like? It's far beyond just providing the sink and the proper chair and the refrigerator and sort of those basic components, how do you mix those very two different age groups? Um, and so I think through this innovative cross process for health and a number of different initiatives, our goal as a district is to really think beyond sort of this lead gold policy that we already have, use some of the other policies in place as a school system and start to leverage that as we build four to five buildings every year. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you also, Matt. Um, you're jumping on the gun. I get to ask a question first. <laughs> relax, relax. So the format, we're, we're trying to make this really quick and engaging, and um, so here, right now, we're gonna do a really quick question for the two of you about schools. Um, I'm glad we talked about lactation rooms, so I don't have to ask you about that. That's my favorite <laughs> pet subject. Um, the, what, I, what I wanted to key in on, though, is that, Matt, you talked about this idea of there was a microsecond. And um, I'd like, like both of you to think about this. Um, of course, you both also talked about process, but if you could say that, okay, the process is important, but what is the most important microsecond in a project to get health built in? Well, I'll, I'll take that as um, I became convinced, and it's actually the way I, I, after working on Buckingham, it really, it really was a fundamental pivot in, um, in my career because what I really realized was, as exciting as it was to do, um, you know, my role was, it was fun to translate and write design guidelines and stuff like that, and that, that, that felt important to our team. But the, actually the most important micro moment in the whole timeline of that project was the moment where the superintendent uh, made it, the core story of the whole project was going to be focused on serving children and, and improving their health. Once, once that was established, it, every other decision could line up around that, whether you were the architect, whether you were the construction team, whether you were the community itself. 
the school board, when it came time when Dina you know, brought to their attention this amazing uh, furniture set that had you know, rocker bottoms uh, and, and there was evidence to even show that it had, you know, it, it reduced sedentary time. It was a more expensive furniture set. But because the narrative was about health, the decision was approved, and actually I think it's a really important part of the building. Andrea, did you have a follow-up as well? A microsecond? I think it's just walking into a school mm. and seeing either the students looking exhausted just sitting at a chair and not getting either outdoor or having movement and me feeling the empowerment to do something to improve that. I don't teach the curriculum. I'm not in the classroom every day, but what can I do so to support that movement and that transition? Thank you both. So next we're going to look at the healthcare sector. And um, we're going to have, uh, first Shannon Krause is going to um, talk about using community planning to help improve healthcare delivery and the health of city residents. And then we will have Dr. Stephanie Taylor talk about how we healthcare facilities can protect patients and also be another tool that doctors can use to help their patients heal. Shannon. This quote struck me, uh, head of my core and architect, uh, former Surgeon General, said, we want public health for all people. If you're an architect, you're a public health worker. And I think that's why we're here. That's why I'm here. That's why uh, this has become a passion of mine. In the United States, we spend more annually on health care than any other uh, uh, country in the world, yet we rank last by almost any measure. Um, 38th in life expectancy, and 36th in infant mortality. Spend more, we get less out of it. And when you look at the headlines, much of the conversation, particularly over the last several years, has been on health care reform. But the reality is, is that research shows that 80% of our health is from social determinants, environmental, behavioral factors. Only 20% has anything to do with the quality or access of actual health care you receive. So we're focusing a lot of our money, a lot of our revenue, a lot of our time on the 20%. And I thought to myself, going back to that first quote, what if we spent more energy on the 80%? And then there's other research, some of you have probably seen this from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that shows that your zip code has as much to do with your life expectancy as anything else, right? So very much the physical environment uh, shapes our health and well-being. Where we live impacts how we live. In fact, today, we drive less, or we drive more, we eat less healthy. Many of us live in food deserts where healthy choices are either inconvenient or non-existent. Children, we're talking about, walk or ride a bike to school far less than they did just 40 years ago. It used to be 60% of all children walk or rode their bike to school. Now it's 10%, right? Why? What's the physical environment have to do with that change? And what can design or the built environment do to help change that? And so the way I think about it is I see a gap. I see a lot of siloing. There's a lot of disciplines. This was brought up in an earlier session. There's a lot of disciplines that hyper-focus. They have good research. They have good theories. Uh, in many cases, they, many cases, they have good recommendations. But it's compartmentalized. It's silos. It's not trickling down really into our built environment. And so what I challenged with, and I'll, I'll end with a case study here, is Metro Health. This is a paid client, uh, a health system that's been on the same piece of property for 175 years, but has largely turned its back to the neighborhood and the community that it serves. Literally, there's bars on the parking deck, nice green space in the middle, and they're going to spend a billion dollars creating a new hospital. Now, naturally, we want to think about the health of the patients, the health of the staff. But in interviewing for the project, I recognized that they changed their mission to leading the way to a healthier you and a healthier community. And so in the interview, what I said is, you don't need a new hospital. You need a new method of delivering health for your community. And you can lead that. So what if the investment you're going to make in your physical structure didn't just help the occupants on the inside, but helped bring up the community that you serve and neighbor around. So we thought about the hospital as a center of a seed investment, that that capital could spur development, that the physical environment we create inside the property line can actually be designed to try and connect across outside the property line. So that we get from that urban planning scale, and then you have the building scale, 
and we're trying to stretch across that divide to knit those things together to really focus on wellness. So, of course, most of you know what these are, the health impact assessment that existed for Cleveland. A lot of times they sit on the shelf. They help inform health policy, but they don't always help, help inform design. So we created a tool called a health design assessment where we took the very things out of the health impact assessment, and then we organized a series of community workshops. At first, against the wishes of our client, we had to convince them why this was a good idea. This was our kind of micro moment, but where we said, let us meet with your neighbors. They have a lot of community groups. They have a lot, they're like, well, they're going to want this. They're going to want that. I said, we're not going to promise anything, but we're going to bring them in the room to understand what their needs are. They had a world-class baseball team that had no baseball field right next door. They had... Uh, people growing healthy food down the street, but they had a lack of space for a farmer's market. So we speak in the surface, these seeds of things, many things that other groups were already investing in and could help think about how as we rethink the campus plan, how it might be a catalyst to further some of those ideas. And then we supplemented that with our own research that we do to think about generational design and how different generations respond to different issues differently. And then that led us to kind of think of things across the spectrum. That as we design a hospital, the building, it's not just the inpatient, but health being dynamic all the way to prevention. So how can this campus, fundamentally a hospital, actually change design on health and well-being? So we ended up with, and this is not the current plan, it's evolved since then, but the big ideas um, spread across the park. Open green spaces for community events. The Metro Health, their color's blue. They now hold a blues festival, which features healthy uh, foods, blues, music, the idea to get the community out. Um, ballpark, community garden, um, public transit. Uh, they're a safety net hospital, so a lot of people come by bus and rapid transit. So creating a campus that begins to knit these things together, including a science and health high school, a special high school for the area residents to come in um, and help elevate their education. So that's where we're coming at this from, is thinking how do we think beyond the property lines? We need to do all the things that are being talked about within our buildings, but we need to think about how our buildings impact blocks and neighborhoods and, and the connective tissue around them. And quite often, that's where we fall short. We can create a lead gold, lead platinum building, but if you can't walk three blocks safely to get to it, then I think we failed. So that's where we're at. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here, and I'm very honored to be here myself. So I have seven minutes, right? So be obvious, because I... I'm going to be like that. Oh, but be really <laughs> obvious. So my name is Stephanie Taylor. I'm a physician, um, and I also got my master's in architecture and engineering. So my story uh, that preceded my being here today is that I was seeing patients in pediatric oncology, at the Dana-Farber Center in Boston, and I was concerned about the number of my kids who were getting new infections from being in the hospital. And they were dying of these infections. Do you hear a whistling when I talk? Yeah, what, what, what's that? Is that my way of articulating? You're fine. Okay. So I tried to talk to the building people of, at the hospital about these infections, and they didn't know how to talk to me. And frankly, I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't know what a building plan was. I didn't know what a section, elevation. So I went back to school and got my master's in architecture and engineering. I mean, that makes sense, right? <laughs> so how much does the building really matter to patient outcomes? So we were supposed to have a slide saying who we were talking about, but I got here talking about patients. I don't know why my colleagues didn't do that. But anyway, so there's some alarming health trends going on in the world today. The, this flu season was terrible. Did anyone get the flu? Was it bad? Yeah. Or are you supposed to say yes? She said it wasn't bad. How bad was it? <laughs> it was bad. It was one of the worst uh, seasons in the history of monitoring influenza. Patients go into the hospital and die from that experience. Going into the hospital is a third leading cause of death in this country. And we're not talking about the reasons you went in. We're talking about going in. And the, one of the reasons for that are these new infections that patients get. Certain diseases are on the rise. Um, 
are we missing something? Well, we also spend 80% of our time indoors. Uh, so Ken Dickerman, who was the, um, the lead designer for the VA system, he retired some years ago um, on the eastern half of the U.S., said, we shape our buildings, then they kill us. Like, that's pretty scary. Thankfully, we can take a look at that because we have new tools in which we can assess our environment. So before we use these tools, we would, if you wanted to see what was in the air or what organisms were around, what would you do? Any infectious disease people here? We'd use a Petri dish, right? You'd put a Petri dish down and see what settled. But then we started using these clinical tools called next generation sequencing. So we now know about the microbiome. We know about all these organisms in and on us and in the air, on surfaces. And we've learned that, first of all, each of us is only about 30% human by cell number. So the next time your significant other says, you know what, you're full of bacteria. You, you can say you're right, and so are you. <laughs> but it ends up that how we manage our buildings, how we design them and ventilate them, will determine which organisms that we put out into the building are going to stick around and replicate. So, you know, Darwin's survival of the fittest. Well, us as people and these organisms as organisms are responding to our the environment, the built environment. And Jess Green out in Oregon, who does a lot of microbiome work, showed that how you ventilate a building or a room and how you use it will determine which organisms stick around. Okay, so if you wanted to be in a situation and you wanted to assess the impact of the building on a person, what would you want? in your assay. You'd want, you'd want your assay to be relevant, specific, meaningful, right? So we're trying to figure out, do you have a good building or a bad building? And we're, and we're talking about health. So if you think about it, think about using the patient as your new Petri dish. So I'm going to talk about hospitals, but think about the patient is not your loved one. Your patient is the litmus paper in the room. And so depending on patient outcome, we can then think about the building. So I was found out about a study that was looking at organisms in a, in a building, and they had monitored all sorts of conditions, and I wanted to find out how the people were doing. So this was a, a study in a hospital in the Chicago area where over the, the course of a year, they looked at indoor conditions, temperature, humidity, lighting, uh, VOCs, CO2, Relative humidity, absolute humidity, all sorts of stuff. And then, we, then they, they were looking at what happened to the organisms, and I called them and said, I want to look at patient outcomes of those rooms, those 10 rooms for over 13 months. Is that possible? 10 minutes later, I got 350 patient files in my email. I was like, whoa, <laughs> HIPAA. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was a microbiologist who didn't know about HIPAA. It ends up... So we looked at these different parameters in the patient room, right? So we're monitoring the room, and then we're looking at patient outcomes. Hand washing, visitors, room air changes. I have two minutes, so I have to talk fast. So of all of these things, which do you think was the most associated with new patient infections? I mean, we heard about hand washing, right? Come on. Come on, you guys, fast. We only have a minute and a half. It ends up, we had 8 million data points from the room. We had about almost 300 patient outcomes. Of all of these parameters, the one that was most related to patient infections was dry indoor air. So air gets dry, infections go up. And as, if you look at this, you can see the, the indoor relative humidity only varied between about 32% up to 42%. But something happened as the relative humidity went down in the room infections went up. So we thought that our statistician had missed a confounding variable. We fired him, got a new one. We didn't believe this. We thought, this is ridiculous, you know. It came back again. This is another study. Okay, this is, so elderly and kids are very vulnerable to uh, disease, infection. So this is a study looking at outcomes in an assisted living memory care facility. And again, we found that when we looked at all those same variables, 
is the last study, that when the relative humidity got below 40%, infections went up. Or this one shows that as the relative humidity was above 40%, infections went down. So indoor relative humidity, 40 to 60% is really, really good. Any architects or engineers may be thinking, oh my gosh, we hate this woman. People think of moisture as being bad. Liquid moisture is bad. Okay, here's an ROI. That hospital in one year lost $15 million from those infections, and you're no longer reimbursed, and they tied up 11,000 patient bed days. That can change. I know you won't be able to read this, but if you, if you installed a humidity system, I don't sell humidifiers, by the way. I don't, I don't know anything about humidifiers, but if you put an expensive system in, and reduce your, your infections by 20%, you'd have a 500% ROI in the first quarter. There's a lot of resistance to this idea that indoor air hydration can be a good thing. And this, is, this slide is just to show you that change is hard. This is me. I love to skydive. I skydive a lot. And that is me doing a face plant. Working alone as a physician got us into antibiotic resistance, got us into exorbitant health care prices, got us into a lot of problems. Medicine's great, but there's some problems. We need to work with building people to get us out of this fix. So thank you very much. Whoa. Thanks to both of you, Shannon and Stephanie. Appreciate it. Um, so I have a quick question. Um, I wanted to uh, hear a little bit about... Um, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit with your slide of the um, oh. <laughs> change. Um, what are the challenges that um, you, know, you are facing when you're proposing, for example, this idea of reaching out and jumping scales, Shannon, going from the hospital scale to the, to the large scale, urban? Yeah, I think she did touch it. Uh, it's, e it's, it's human nature. We love to do typically what's easy. Um, and we fall back on it. Uh, it's predictable. We know what to expect. We can control it better. Um, it might be less stressful. So um, it takes quite a bit of energy to, to overcome that inertia and to really push the boundary and explore something new and not knowing where it's going to lead you. So I think the biggest one is just that predictability. Um, at the end of the day, we didn't end up, um, we still did all that within our normal fee we were able to convince the client that we could do this as a part of a normal design process. So we use more design thinking. Um, and I think that is one attribute that, that architects can contribute to this discipline is design thinking works a little bit different than scientific discovery and research and other things. So again, partnering, collaborating, getting out of our silos will make that change inertia easier um, for all of us. That, Taylor. Yeah. Shannon, that was a great answer. I think that um, Shannon doesn't like the word silos. He uses getting out of your tribe. It's hard to do that. And from my perspective, with these findings about indoor air moisture, the engineers will say, look, you know, if you, if you have minus 10 degrees outdoors, you can't, like, humidify inside. You'll get condensation. You'll get mold. That's all true. But at the same time, the health problems that are resulting from overly dry air and all of the mucosal membrane barrier uh, breaches is, are terrible. So we need to start figuring it out. Thanks to you both. So next, we're going to hear about the office building sector. And we have Dr. Casey Lindbergh and also Brian Steverson that are going to give us a little insight into some of the work that's been done. And, and Esther gave us a preview but, um, this morning, but I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing more from you guys. Thanks. Great, thank you. So Brian and I only have two slides, and I'm just going to keep this one up for my entire time here. Um, and the reason I'm keeping this up here is to just present a uh, who we're building buildings for. Um, we're talking about office spaces, so here's an example of a worker, and to also provide some scale um, for for you guys to keep in mind as I go through some examples. Um, this panel is about policy and practice, but my expertise is on the research end. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about a couple of just examples at a very high level and then show with a connection with another example that Brian has um, in circadian uh, lighting 
um, how those findings can influence policy and practice and what kind of mechanisms um, it might be in action there. Um, so on the slide, you see that this is a very, there are a lot of office workers in America. It's not too surprising, about 50 million uh, Americans, and they spend 20% of their, all of their time in office workplaces. So if 20% sounds like a small number, you think it might be more based on how much you feel like you're at the office. Um, these are just uh, waking hours. Uh, if you think about just waking hours during the week, then it's more like half of your time, right? So a lot of time. Um, and the workplace-related illnesses cost us, uh, the U.S., $225 billion each year. Um, so any way that you can sort of influence that triangle of outcomes that Esther talked about earlier today as part of the Well-Built for Well-Being project, um, where I've been managing the academic side for the last few years at the University of Arizona, um, if you can influence people's sleep quality in a positive way, if you can influence their physical activity in a positive way, or their stress in a positive way, it's going to have a positive influence on the rest of those outcomes. Um, if you negatively influence them, they have a negative influence on the other um, outcomes as well. Um, so a little bit about the, the, the Well-Built for Well-Being project. Um, Esther did a great job explaining um, sort of the overview of methods and the teams involved. Um, and it is a complicated team um, and an, an integrated team within the University of Arizona and now, the, now other school systems as well. Um, as we have physiological experts, we have data experts, we have psychologists, and we have people involved in design um, as well. But by working with the General Service Administration, we can really influence policy and practice a little more immediately because of their large influence and in how buildings are managed and operated, as well as their own uh, very large portfolio. Um, so I'm going to just provide three quick examples, just at a very high level. So you already heard about the physical activity finding earlier today, and just as a reminder, we found that um, workers that spent or workers that were stationed basically in open bench seating offices, so. Um, offices or office workstations where you can easily see over um, partitions while you're seated um, had more physical activity at work compared to those in traditional cubicles who in turn had more physical activity than those in private offices. And the physical activity that one spent um, at work or that one uh, exhibited at work was then indirectly tied to how much stress they had outside the office. So the more physically active you were at work, the less stress outside the office. And that's a really interesting relationship and, again, speaks to that triangle of things that we are very interested in health outcomes. Um, so one way that, that this finding can have an influence on practice and policy is through publication. So that, that finding is in press right now. Um, and then the other is through meetings like this, right? Um, so... Uh, getting people together that come from disparate fields that no longer are so disparate and are beginning to be more integrated um, is a really good thing and helps uh, promote the awareness for people that have influence in practice and in policy. Um, of course, there are limitations. So from an academic side, you don't want every single finding to influence policy if it's not a good finding, if it's not valid, if it's not reliable. Um, so each of these examples that I'm going to go through um, have their own kind of internal struggle within the academic world before they can begin to influence other worlds around them that are connected. Um, so for the physical activity finding, this is an observational study only. So an observational study, you can never prove causality. So what else can we do to kind of eke out as much information from that finding as, as we can? Well, one thing that we can do is to start looking a little deeper into um, how individuals um, may differ in these physical activity patterns based on these workstation findings that we had. So for instance, do... Um, uh, do workers that are very high in extroversion behave a little bit differently when they are in um, an open bench workstation uh, layout versus private offices or cubicles? So answering questions like that can be really interesting as well. Aging is another individual difference variable that's very important to consider. Um, another uh, finding that we had or another method really that we used was to measure CO2. CO2 is a very hot topic right now. Uh, we'll hear more, more about that, I'm sure, tomorrow morning with Joe Allen. Um, uh, for, for our methods in our study, one thing that we did was we measured CO2 around the neck. So we measured CO2 locally as well as sort of in a traditional wall-mounted uh, method. Um, and we found some kind of confusing things, and we were wondering what we could really make of that data. And uh, because it's a new method and we realized that you have this sort of column of air around you that's in your own sort of personal bubble, we need to reach out to another academic institution that had the resources available to help us understand whether we could use that data in a valid way. 
Um, so the Center for the Built Environment in Berkeley helped us uh, by using their test chambers and varying different CO2 levels and using those same methods that we had used in our study to help understand whether or not um, that was getting a consistent sort of reliable measure of CO2 uh, for an inhalation zone or for a background level zone. Um, and as part of that work, some other interesting things came out of it. For instance, um, if you just have a very small personal fan pointed at you, you can break that bubble of CO2 by at least a few hundred ppm, which is a pretty big deal. Um, if the, COG, the COGFX studies results are anywhere near reality, that's a really big deal. Um, so breaking your bubble by walking around or having a small fan pointed towards you can really lower the, the ppm of CO2 around you in a, in a meaningful way. Um, the last quick example is about relative humidity. We just heard about relative humidity um, from Stephanie Taylor. Um, we also found that if you took um, the majority of time, or if you took participants that spent the majority of their time in that traditional ASHRAE comfort zone from a while ago that was, used to be enforced, which was 30 to 60 percent, and you compared them to people that spent the majority of their time in very dry conditions or very wet conditions, you found that the people in the comfort zone between 30 and 60 percent actually had less stress while they're at the office as measured by heart rate variability. And that was indirectly significantly tied to objectively measured sleep quality. So those that had less stress at the office had higher sleep quality at night. So again, affecting this triangle um, of really sort of golden outcomes um, that are all reciprocal um, at the workplace. Um, as Stephanie kind of hinted, there's a lot of pushback to any kind of benefit that might be seen in any kind of study um, for low um, for low con low humidity conditions, uh, because people start worrying about well, what are we going to do if we try to humidify the air and all the problems that's going to cause um, in building management and different systems. Um, so the path forward for that research finding was a little different. We um, had a, a gathering of um, subject matter experts, uh, many of whom are in this room and behind me, um, and got their opinions on the matter, coming from different academic institutions as well as standard setting organizations. Um, and this really helped us inform what, uh, what is an appropriate next step um, to take. And for a, a, a controversial finding that has such drastic implications in the built environment and building operations um, as relative humidity control, the appropriate next step there is turned out to be, well, let's do an intervention study because it's really hard to control for certain things like season um, when you're talking about humidity, um, relative humidity in just sort of a, a natural observation method. Um, so an intervention study will be next. Um, and then Brian now, I think we'll talk a little bit more about another example and some more policy and practice. All right, so, whoa, sorry guys. Uh, so the challenge for me is that a typical 45 minute to an hour talk on circadian lighting has been reduced to seven minutes. So I have notes and I apologize that I will be looking at them just so I stay on record or stay on track. So I'm Brian Steverson. I work for GSA's Office of Federal High Performance Buildings. Kevin Campshire is my boss and he told us before lunch that if we don't build healthy buildings or if we don't build uh, healthy workplaces that we're all idiots, right? That's what I heard, so I think we have a task. Um, so uh, background about GSA is on the screen here, and so we have a lot of buildings, right? We have a lot of people in our buildings, and we have a lot of older buildings, and we're not really building a lot of new buildings anymore. Um, so the importance and also the challenge for all of us is that the things that we're talking about are things that we really also should be focusing on for existing buildings, not necessarily building these really big, tall, well daylit spaces. I shouldn't say that because my thing is daylighting and, and lighting in general, but we gotta really realize that we can't always have the best buildings at GSA because we just have so many older buildings that have been re retrofitted for other purposes, that are now office buildings, used to be warehouses, et cetera. So that's a huge challenge. Um, Casey, uh, Dr. Lindbergh, sorry, already uh, alluded to the fact that, um, you know, we have done a couple studies at GSA, uh, one with the well, Built for Well Building uh, program, the other one for circadian effective lighting. Um, those are really two complex studies that we cannot cover in seven minutes. Um, but the point, though, is, is, as he mentioned, is because they're complex, and Shannon actually hit it on the head earlier about collaboration, we really have to get people from different disciplines to collaborate and talk through these issues. Who, 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 who here is an architect? Who here is a scientist or researcher? And doctors? Building managers? No building managers? Okay, so we need that's next, right? 
Okay. So um, we're all here, and we're all in different fields, and I think that's a great first, second step to really talk through what can be done. We convened a bunch of uh, different groups together, as, as uh, was just mentioned, standard organizations, um, building managers, decision makers, uh, real estate decision makers, on basically becoming a sounding board on these are some of the findings that we have found. Which of these makes sense? Which of these do you think we could actually condense into bite-sized, operationalized strategies that we could promote and do in the field and test, measure, and then report back? Or which are those that you think maybe we need to incubate further because it's just not ready yet for prime time? Um, lighting, for me, uh, I've been working on lighting for uh, five years. Uh, we've been working with the Lighting Research Center from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute to do a couple of studies looking at just daylighting in buildings and then looking at doing interventions in federal agencies both here in the U.S. and abroad um, and U.S. embassies and seeing how people that work in the offices, how are they being impacted by either the amount of light they're getting or the amount of light they're not getting. And then for the daylighting study, what we really found was that, of course, if people are getting enough daylighting, especially in the morning, because what we found is that's the most important time, is they're falling asleep faster at night by almost 30 minutes. So if I told you, go outside 30 minutes in the morning because you're going to get 30 minutes more sleep at night, I bet you a lot of people in this room would probably run out the door right now, although it's not morning, so it doesn't really work. Um, but the point is, is those kind of findings are great. So how do we actually create a policy for that in our buildings? And we have so many different types of agencies, so many different types of work that they do. We have intelligence agencies. We have people that are chained to their desks for 9, 10, 11 hours a day. So what can we do as GSA to share, share with them what they can do to actually enhance their health and well-being while at work? So those are things that we're starting now to pilot uh, within GSA. Uh, we have a group that does uh, workspace renovations around the country. And so we're starting to implement both the ideas and, and findings from Dr. Lindbergh's study and, and the study that I did. Uh, to see how we can actually start really promoting this. I think another uh, challenge that we're constantly working on is just the educational piece. People really don't understand um, what circadian effective lighting is and why it matters and how it impacts them personally, um, also at work, but also at home as well. Um, and I think uh, getting guidance out there, getting information, getting bite-sized bits of information out there. Um, this is all really complicated information, research. And it's really important to translate it into something that's bite-sized that can be implemented and put into practice. So we're starting to do that on some pilots within GSA. We're also just two weeks ago, um, if you guys have heard of the Sustainable Facilities Tool, SF Tool, um, we just uh, put up a buildings and health module. So go to sftool.gov and you'll see it there on the homepage. But that contains a lot of background information on everything within health and wellness. Um, it cites a lot of really great studies. It also gives tips. Um, it's a very interactive website. I encourage you after this, or even now on your phone, uh, go to it, check it out. We'll soon also be publishing guidance on, that's called Lighting Matters, and that's really lighting from A to Z, but then circadian lighting's also been um, sewn in there throughout to give people a background on what circadian lighting is, again, why it's important, and what you can do in any workspace, whether it's raising the blinds, whether it's having a walking, talking meeting outside for 30 minutes in the morning, et cetera. Um, the, the last thing I'll leave you with, though, is that GSA is the provider of workspaces for the federal government, right? But how many people here actually telework some, right? I mean, I telework, right? So not only is it important for GSA as a provider of workspace, physical workspace, to inform people what things they can do to make them happier, healthier while at work, we should also be doing things or t showing or gi giving ideas for people what they can do at home, okay? Because at the end of the day, we all bring our work home with us, right? But we also bring our home to work with us the next day. So for instance, if you're up late tonight on an iPad or some kind of self-luminous device pretty late and you're getting a lot of blue light coming into your eyes, I bet you might be a little bit tireder tomorrow. You might be a little crankier and you may not really necessarily be present in the room. So it's just important to let people know what you can do at work, of course, but also outside of work. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it back over. Great. So Brian, Brian and Casey, um, I just have a couple questions for you. And then um, 
I'll have a couple for the whole group, but then we're going to be one of your questions in the audience, so be thinking about that right now. Um, what, I, what I really wanted to get back to um, is in terms of, um, I, I think, Casey, in terms of um, architectural and interior design decisions, can you talk about maybe how those are, um, those are becoming data-driven and how you and your research and, and the work with, um, with GSA is, is informing that? Yeah, that's a really good question, and um, I'll, I'll interpret it as um, well-being research, right? So things that have to do with health and well-being. Um, and, and the short answer is still I don't think many are, um, and there are a lot of really real obstacles that make a lot of sense why those obstacles are there. Um, and there probably are some opportunities to, to fix that um, with people like, like this. Um, and it, I, I've had the opportunity over the last few months um, this year to talk more directly with architecture firms um, and their uh, research directors, their sustainability directors, um, all sorts of different titles um, that often kind of boil down to the same thing from my perspective, which is improving um, the built environment with real projects with real research. Um, and there's a couple of different ways, I think, to do that uh, better um, and that are happening at certain firms to different degrees, of course. Some, some are represented here today because they're doing the right thing and they're on that right track. Um, so one is top down, one is bottom up. From top down, we're talking about leadership within the firm. If there's buy-in, if there's a message, then that can filter down. Um, to convince top down decision makers, they need to understand ROI and they need to understand um, that a little more clearly probably than most research projects can offer, especially when you just have one new finding or a couple smatterings of findings that have very different methodologies in different places. Um, but if you can offer them an opportunity for something that's at a completely different scale, I think that's where you can kind of get um, their attention. So even if you miss on an ROI by a little bit, if the scale is completely different, um, then you're probably going to be winning if you're taking out a lot of those projects. Um, and the other is bottom up, right? So that's education of a design student. Uh, when I went to architecture school, having a scientific background, I took that for granted um, and didn't understand how little um, scientific literacy there was within the design community at, this, at the college student or master's student level. Um, and so uh, education, um, uh, as it shifts now and uh, more schools sort of join this health and well-being initiative and, and, and uh, have students that understand a little more is really important. Um, and really what I'm talking about, I think, for both is, is bridge building. So building that bridge between science and practice, it comes from both of those levels. And then you're trying to get the employed, you know, middle career architect in the middle um, to buy in as well, where inertia is really powerful. And if they've done something that's already worked for a long time, it's going to be hard to get them to change. So they need those influences from, from up and down and, and those bridges built within the firm as well. So building on that, Brian, what are some things that GSA is doing? I know you mentioned the SF tool, and that's a great way to take some of the things that GSA is learning and share those. Um, are there other things that you guys are doing that are helping? With yeah, so I, and I'll tag on to what uh, my colleague here just said, is that you know I think the bottom up is also critical in looking at uh, people who reside in buildings they also are going to demand change if they know what they need, right? And that's going to drive everything. That's going to drive the entire market. And so certification systems that are out there, tools that are out there, have already done a great job in pushing us all to think about that. Um, for GSA, we have been putting out some webinars. We participated in webinars with other agencies and really just trying to get the information out on what we've been working on and what others have been working on, too, because we, we've only done two, you know, two big studies that's nothing compared to what else is already out there, too. So I think from GSA's perspective, the webinars, the constant communication, the holding of different convenings, the uh, getting to public meetings. Uh, Ken Sandler's here. He's, he is the uh, federal officer for our Green Building Advisory Committee. And so sharing that information publicly does a tremendous, I, I, in my opinion, does a tremendous amount of work for us long term just to getting more people um, Understanding exactly what we're talking about. I mean, I think, you know, 10 years ago, if we mentioned the words circadian lighting, maybe even five years ago, people would really kind of scratch their heads and not understand what we were talking about. Agreed. Thank you. So let's give them all a round of applause. Um, 
As the moderator's prerogative, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but um, really be approaching the, those um, mics out there, please, and um, have your questions ready. So, the, um, so one of the things I took um, took away from this discussion, well, a few things. I don't know what you said, sound bites or small bits of information, bite-sized bite -size pieces of information. Um, I need to buy a personal fan and carry that around all the time, and I should go outside every morning, right? Okay. Um, and then relative humidity, I'm not sure how I solved that individually, but okay, 40 to 60% relative humidity. So I can get a humidifier and set it to that in my office. So, um, um, but, but seriously, I mean, these are the kinds of things that um, we're all looking for to help the public kind of push practice, right? I think that was part of the point. Um, I, I, I do want to also bring up, there's this question of building managers, how do we engage? There weren't any, I didn't see any facilities or building managers. We have um, a couple of owners where some of us have the owner's hat on. But um, from, from the panel, um, anybody have any good um, ideas or um, stories about how we're engaging building managers or what that next step looks like? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. I don't have any a great answer for that, but I also can look back historically and say, would you want to live on a radioactive landmine? And, you know, if, if you, most of us would say no. So people have changed. So from my perspective, this whole thing about humidity, you know, people say, well, the, that's very hard with the building envelope. Well, actually, next door at the Animal Research Lab here at the NIH, 40 to 60 percent, because there's a price tag on the head of those animals, and it's known. So I guess that's not really an answer. It's just a way of saying, you know what? The Mona Lisa is in a perfectly managed environment. Those animals are. We can be. It might be hard. Andrea, did you have something? Yeah, I would add, um, I'm assuming this is on, right? I, I think I'm good. Oh. Um, so I think we've, you know, previously we talked a lot about like the RFP process and getting it in, but that turnover and the operation side is so critical to the success of a project. I think a lot of people talk about the O&M manuals and training and videos, all of which we do for every school, sort of within a two or three week period, and that's not enough. We're expecting these custodials and the foremen to come into a brand new building. They don't ha have no idea how to run any of these systems, and to expect them to absorb it all in a matter of a couple weeks and then give them a big binder that says this is how you do it, um, just doesn't work in the end, uh, especially when it's all new mechanical systems. And so I think as a school system, we're really reevaluating what does that training component look like? What is that year long as they sort of adjust to this new school? Um, and then sort of before that component, we now have a summer program that uh, we're running with the custodials that come in. So for a couple lead custodians from the school, they get trained in green cleaning, and then they're actually brought in as part of the design process. So as we start to pick finishes and select different uh, materials, bringing them in, talking about with them what's working, what's not, and sort of letting them weigh and buy in. They, at the end of the day, they run those. Whether it's a school or any other facility, they are that critical point. Even myself, I'm, I'm not in that school every day. It's not possible, and they are really that critical factor. So engaging them much earlier than just turning over a building to them at the end and expect that they know what to do is sort of unrealistic. Great. Let me add one. May add one thing. This has a green light. <laughs> me and microphones. Um, I think one of the bigger uh, challenges I see is even with a lot of people that want to do the right thing in the same room. Um, there's uh, tribalism or fragmentation even within the same client. So a lot of times the people procuring the project mm -hmm. that, that, that run the RFP process, that select the team, uh, a lot of times it's on a lowest fee basis, uh, lowest first cost, and they're not the group responsible for operating facilities, so they don't care as much about operation, operational costs. They're focused on lowest first, lowest first cost. And even though you might be able to pencil out an ROI that says, well, a little bit more investment on first cost will save you millions of dollars over the life of the facility, their metric, they don't get, they, they'll get dinged if they have a, a dollar over budget here, even though it might save millions of dollars over there. 
And so that disconnect even comes down to the health of a building. So I'll give you one specific example. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have an argument, and it is an argument, with um, operation, uh, facility operational folks that say, we want one soiled clean room on the floor because I've got a staff, they're going to deliver it, we're going to clean it, and we're going to move it out. And we'll say, well, it would be better uh, for nurse fatigue and more care at the patient bedside and many other, this is all researched, if you hired a few more lower cost staff, they could hire less nursing staff, have more time at the bedside, you distribute it to more places on the floor, then they're walking shorter distance. Not my problem, right? I, <laughs> they're fra we're fragmented. So with this cross-discipline isn't just industry to industry, it's even within the same walls of a building will be fragmented. We, we don't we get tribalized and we only worry about what we're being measured against for our job description and heaven forbid we branch out beyond that. That's great. So I'm gonna hand it over to a um, question on the floor. Thank you, thanks for the panel. My name's Li Yang and we talk about a lot of architecture and we have a employee sickness and uh, hospital infections. But I just wonder, besides the in architecture, I just wonder if you have studied the infection or patients, they have problem is because of the, the hospital didn't <coughs> have a clean practices. Like they didn't really keep the patient clean and not that they don't wash their face or body, but actually they don't change their, their PP or poo poo. And in fact, a lot of people, patients, they cannot move because of the irresponsibility or mis misconduct by the hospital or their staff, including EM services. So uh, if that is a case, this is maybe more important than changing the new buildings. You know, that's so basic that the practice, the cleanliness and, and treat patients in, in better care is more important than a, a new buildings. So I just say, is there any statistic of study or you intend to do or something? I think this is probably is very important factors to affect the patients and, and their healthness. So I think you're saying um, has have hospitals looked at the consequence of not maintaining patient hygiene? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, no, it's not just they don't do anything, but they cause it with misconduct. And maybe even food poisonous, or even some serious, like unsafe food. And mm -hmm. in employment, you might have an employer induced stress Sickness yeah. and even death. I think it sounds like you might have had some experience with this, um, or you sound passionate about it. And I think there are many variables about, there are many things that impact whether or not a patient's going to leave the hospital alive or better um, than when they came in. And it's a, it's a, sounds like maybe you've had some experiences around that. And I, I think I and I'm sorry a if lot. that's the case. Yeah, and I heard people say hospital is really is a, most dangerous and uh, dirtiest place <laughs> than anywhere on the street. Yeah, they, they, let's you and I talk about it some more afterwards if you would like to, because it sounds like we could have a good conversation. But is there any studies of this sort? Because the data collection is very important, or they just ignore it. There is a lot of research that the Facilities Guidelines Institute has helped fund. I think it was a Canadian university that did a lot on infect, sources of infection, sources of falls, medication errors, any harmful, um, um, they looked at a large swath of things, both cause and effect of um, things that might cause hospital-based harm to a patient. Um, and they used a lot of that research uh, to make the case for going to private rooms because there was uh, some correlation between the, some of those incidents having to do with not wanting to interrupt if there's two patients in the room with necessary cleaning and that kind of stuff. So um, there is some research out there. I don't know if there's a one place to find it all, um, but there are many universities that have been dealing and picking at different components of this. 
from medication errors to falls to uh, hygiene, um, infection control. Um, I would say the, built, the physical environment does uh, influence behavior. Um, there are triggers, um, you know, where you put the sink in a room or how you orient can either uh, cause people and help encourage them to do the right thing or it can actually become a barrier to doing the right thing. Great, thank you guys. So um, another question? Yeah, so I'm curious about you all talking a little bit about single versus multifactorial issues. So you talked about humidity or daylighting, um, sort of single variables, and then microbiome, complex, um, schools, building resilience in children. And so I'm curious how in the architectural process, the LECO there, you balance the importance of the single variable issues, we've got to get kids to lie, to the multifactorial variables that really build the whole individual over time. Can, can I answer that? So, uh, so, you know, I mentioned uh, we have colleagues here in the room, uh, Jerry Britton, who was part of our team. We, we took on this idea of like outside of a really, we, you have this opportunity to do more controlled studies you have one option in terms of how to set up research. But what Joel's getting at is like if you try to do this in like a real school setting, uh, it's really complicated. And like how to do those things, and, and, um, and we, we tried to do this. You know, how do you craft like an NIH style uh, you know, grant uh, proposal when it's like a, a real live school district? And things happen like, I don't know, like we have a perfect, we had like, you know, two schools closed during the middle of your study and stuff like that. One of them was going to be your control. Uh, these are, I mean, the reality is those are, um, that's going to keep happening. That's real life. So to get to Joel's point, the way our team kind of um, thought about it, which I, I've become pretty passionate about, is that there are sets of this conversation we're having in this room that are what I would kind of term uh, deterministic relationships of the building and has a deterministic impact on a health outcome. Things like relative humidity, I think, is a, I learned a lot today about that. Where we thought, well, when you're talking about childhood obesity, we realized that our challenge was uh, manifold, but one was um, we had decades that what I really brought in when I brought in that stack of papers, I didn't bring in anything actually architectural. I brought in evidence-based, school-based uh, programming about childhood obesity prevention. And we realized that our challenge actually wasn't to make one particular deterministic change, but we realized actually a better way to frame our challenge was, and a better way to frame our evaluation was, how can we build the best platform for delivering that programming? And we actually even started to term it as, if that's the software you want to run, how do you make the best hard computer hardware, essentially, uh, and then evaluate how well the hardware ran the program. <laughs> um, so, because Joel, I agree with you. Like, you, I think there's it's not either or, but we have to have. There's actually a we're at a, a, a moment of inventing whole new methodologies as well. Thank you. Great answer. Um, so, with that, I'd like to. Um, we're we're out of time. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists one more time. Everyone, help me with that. <laughs> And then I just want to issue kind of a challenge to all of you. What I heard today was um, that each of us has the opportunity to affect public health, to affect health, to be a public health professional, um, to affect a person's life. And um, so I think that when we're sitting there drawing our um, wall sections or deciding what materials we're putting into a building or crafting the process for how people come together and talk about what our, um, what our real purpose is in the building we're building, um, if we can all interject that idea that people's lives matter and that we all have the power to affect that. I challenge you to do that. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, with that, thank you very much. Uh, you know, join me again for a round of applause for this excellent panel. They did a great job. Thank you.